for all of the children out there this morning, and particularly for all of the little boys in the room, I want to ask you, did you know that God, through his work of providence, has told the best poop joke in his inspired word? Not where you thought we were going this morning. That God, through his work of providence, in his inspired word, has told the best poop joke, and we are going to see that this morning. And saints, did you know that by telling this providential poop joke, the Lord is displaying a glorious picture of the gospel, which he certainly is in the account we get to this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn in them to Judges chapter 3. I promise I'm not just trying to be flippant this morning with the Word of God, but there is a comedy that we see in God's Word this morning as it pertains to the details of the Scriptures. And as we're studying the book of Judges, this morning we come to the second judge in Judges chapter 3, the judge of Ehud. And really, this morning's text covers the story of the contrast of two men in the Scriptures. There is Ehud, the judge on one hand, the deliverer sent from God, and there is Eglon on the other hand, the one who comes against the people of God. And as we will see in this glorious text, there is some humorous humiliation. There's some humorous humiliation, which is the title of this morning's sermon. So let's hear what God's Word has to say to us from Judges chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Hear the word of the Lord, saints. It says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites, and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it to his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And he, Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed. When they, he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took a key and opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sirah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him, from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. 
And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Will you pray with me? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray that as we come to your word this morning, in a narrative that's incredibly engaging to our imaginations and our thoughts, that we would read this and understand that your scriptures are not merely a collection of fun or just merely humorous stories, but your scriptures are here to proclaim first and foremost Christ. So Lord, I pray that we would see the rich connections to Christ as we study this text this morning. Lord, I pray that we would be able to mock at the complete incompetence of sin and rebellion against you. And Lord, I pray that you give us eyes to see how we personally need to apply this text to our own lives. Lord, would you help us to be faithful and reverent to you this morning? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we've been working through the book of Judges, last week we came to the first judge, Othniel, and we saw some incredible information about who these judges are, that they were not primarily the spiritual leaders of the people, that would have been the job of the Levites, the priests, but they were the defenders of the people, that God raised these people up in order to address the wickedness amongst the people, in order to flee from them those who were oppressing them. And so as they served a role of judging within the body to help clear up problems, but they also served a military function in order to judge nations that were oppressing them throughout the book of Judges. And we see a picture of this in Othniel last week as he saved the people from their sin. They were rebelling against God, and thus God allowed King, if you remember his name, meant double wicked to come and take over them from the land of proto-Babylon, what would become Babylon later. And the people cry out, and God raises up a deliverer for them. If you remember, the Hebrew word for that was Yasha, which Yeshua, Jesus, comes from. And God gives them a savior, a deliverer, through the person of Othniel. And this Othniel, this deliverer, came up and crushed King Double Wicked and gave the people, if you remember at the end of it, rest, right, in the Lord from their persecution that they had been under because of their sin. Well, as we move into this week, as you look down at your text in verse 12, the first line of it, unfortunately, is the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They did not learn their lesson of the redemption that they experienced under Othniel, but unfortunately, they repeated that sad pattern of after a generation of rest, Now they go back to their idols and again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So what we're going to look at this morning is three points from this narrative. The first is old enemies in verses 12 through 14. The second is a stinky strike in verses 15 through 25. And the third is the faithful follow-up in verses 26 through 30. Let's begin by considering the old enemies in verses 12 through 14. If you have been paying attention in the book of Judges, the details of the battles and the enemies are quite significant with symbolism. These aren't random enemies coming against random people, but God continues to use very particular people and places in order to communicate what's happening to the people spiritually. And this is certainly true as we get to Ehud as well. What do we learn in these texts after we see that the people again did was evil in the sight of the Lord? Listen to what it says. It says, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Here we see that the Lord is the one who strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, in order to come against them. We must not miss that finer detail. Who was it that allowed this king of Moab to come and to rule over them? It was the hand of the Lord. It was the Lord who strengthened this man and raised him up. And who was it that 
this man was over. We'll get more in just a little bit to who this guy Eglon really was. But who was he over? He says he was the king of Moab. And then it goes on to say as well that the Ammonites and the Amalekites joined with him as the king of Moab. So we got this king over the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Amalekites. Well, who were these people? And what significance does it have that God was allowing them to be ruled by them? Well, if you go back to Genesis 19, both Moab and Ammon, where the Moabites and the Ammonites come from, are the offspring of Lot. If you remember Lot and Abraham, what happened was God brought judgment upon two incredibly wicked cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, but allowed Lot and his family to come out and to be saved based on the intercession of Abraham. And what happens after Lot and his daughters are saved from the fire? of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, we read that his daughters got him drunk and had incestuous relationship with their father and had some sons. And who were their sons? They were the offspring of the Moabites and the Ammonites, all right? So as these people are coming against Israel, think of these people as the offspring of Sodom and Gomorrah. These are the incestuous offspring of a people that are typified in rebellion against God. Now, last week, we saw with Othniel that it was proto-Babylon, right? If you were going to pick three cities or three places or people that embody wickedness in the Old Testament, who would you pick? You would pick Babylon, Sodom, Gomorrah, right? Those are like the key places we think of that embody wickedness and rebellion against the Lord. And in the first two judges, we see those are the people that God is raising up against them. But what about Amalek and the Amalekites? We see that they're joined into this as well. Well, Amalek was the first nation that Israel defeated after their redemption. Often when we think of Israel being freed from Egypt, we think God led them through the Red Sea and then boom, they're right at Mount Sinai and God's giving them the law. But actually between going through the Red Sea and getting to Sinai, they fought one battle. Who was that battle against? Is against the Amalekites, right? These were the first people that God had given them victory over as they were freed from Egypt. And there's one more little detail we see at the end of verse 13 that's significant. It says in verse 13, and they took possession of the city of what? Palms, right? What was the city of Palms? That was Jericho. So here with having the Amalekites, right? Think of the first enemy that they were conquered after being freed from Egypt. And what was the first city that they conquered in the promised land? It was the city of Palms, right? So now they're being brought back to the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're being conquered by their first conquest. That's what the picture of what's happening here as they come under them. And really, as we go on to look at King Eglon, think of him really as like the Sodomite king. That is a picture of what this man is in this text. So Sodom and Gomorrah was their king. The people and places of their victory were, not the pl were now the places of their captivity. This is a symbolic blow used by God in order to teach them a hard lesson. And I think the psalm that we read during our scripture reading this morning could not have fit more perfectly as we read about the Lord who disciplines people and even nations. Well, certainly they were under the discipline here. And how long were they under this reign of these ungodly people based on their rebellion? It says 18 years. Now, if you noted last time with Othniel, how long were they under the reign of King Double Wicked? It was eight years. Now we see a compounding effect to that with this second run that now they are being oppressed for 18 years. A sin compounds, so do the punishments. A just judge gives a more severe punishment to a repeat offender, does he not? If you get arrested for something one time, you're probably going to get punishment. Maybe you'll get sort of a slap on the wrist. But then if six months later, you're back in front of that same judge for doing the same thing, what would a just judge do, right? He would give you a more severe punishment, right? Right? Maybe you just had to do a little community service last time, but guess what? Now you're going to have to do some time behind bars. And maybe you did time behind bars, but maybe now you're going to have to do more time behind bars, right? There's this very understandable principle that if you keep doing the same thing, 
you're going to get worse and worse punishments. Why? Hopefully so that you'll learn your lesson. Well, obviously the first punishment didn't work. Maybe we need to up the punishment so now that you will learn. Well, we see this principle playing out with God that now the people are having 18 years in captivity rather than just eight. I must warn us that for us as well, the same principle applies in our own sin. If you continue to do the same sins over and over again, don't expect the same results. Don't expect the same results. And often you'll hear, well, you keep doing the same thing, you'll keep getting the same results, right? That's not the way sin actually works. If you keep doing the same sins, expect the results to get worse and worse and worse as you go. Let me give you some examples of this. Let's say a spouse catches um, their other spouse looking at inappropriate content, right? And they, they catch them in the act. Well, that first time, there's likely going to be a lot more grace, compassion, understanding, working through things than the 10th time, right? The implications of that repeated sin on that relationship are going to compound the more it happens. Most people have a lot of sympathy for a one-off mistake, but when it's done over and over again, you see how that trust begins to erode. That stability within the family will wreak havoc for the children in the room. What happens when you're caught lying to your parents? Well, the first time you'll probably get in trouble. You'll probably get disciplined, right? But there's also going to be kind of an understanding from your parent. You're a child. You're learning things. You're going to learn not to do this again. They're not going to freak out, though. It's not like you're the first kid that's ever lied to their parents, right? But what happens as a child when you lie to your parents over and over and over again? They're going to begin to not trust you, right? They're going to begin to take away responsibilities from you. They're going to begin to question the things that you say to them, right? As those sins compound, so will the consequences. This is a normal pattern of life. And here we see the Lord's discipline multiply as the people become repeat offenders. We must learn that that principle is still in application today, as we know from Hebrews, that the Lord still disciplines those he loves as a father and does a son in whom he delights. Our God will still discipline us in our sin, and we should expect, if we keep going against our Father's will, that the discipline will get more and more severe as we go. Which leads to our second point, and that stinky strike in verses 15 through 25. And we must realize as we go into the, this section that as men mock a holy God, who is going to get the final laugh? As men mock a holy God, who is it that's going to get the final laugh? Those that scoff at the Lord or the Lord himself? I want to just read this section through one more time as a whole because it's in the narrative, it's in the whole that we really get the impact of what's happening here. And then we're going to go through line by line and see some of the details. But look at, back down at your Bible at verse 15 with me. It says, Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat, and Ehud reached to his left hand and or reached with his left hand and took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. 
Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. So in this text, we see this just incredible narrative happening between this deliverer, this judge God had raised up, and this king of Sodom, so to speak, that had become the ruler over the people. Now, this text begins with an incredibly important verse. What does it say? That the people cry out to the Lord. The people cry out to the Lord. And what does God do in response? He sends to them a deliverer. And this is a glorious pattern that we see throughout the book of Judges. In one sense, it's so disheartening that the people time and time again run after their idols and their foreign gods. But yet in the Lord's discipline, what do we see time and time again? They turns the heart of the people back to him through their discipline. Let me ask you, they were worshiping foreign gods at the beginning of the text, but who did they know to turn to when things got rough? Did they cry out to these foreign gods? No, they knew they were incompetent to save them, right? They cried out to the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel, their covenant-keeping God, and the Lord who's gracious and merciful to his people answered them. And who did he send to them? He sent to them a left-handed Benjaminite, who would send to them tribute, right? Which is a glorious thing. Now, note that detail about him being left-handed because it comes significantly into play here in a little bit. But what is it that we see that this deliverer that God had raised up, this savior for the people that God raised up, what is it that he armed himself as he prepared in order to go meet with King Eglon? Well, it's not an accident that the details describe that he had a two-edged sword, right? A double-edged sword. Now, where else does the Bible talk about a two-edged sword coming from a deliverer? Well, it says in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Well, in this text, do we certainly see a sharp two-edged sword that's piercing? Well, it pierces quite a ways in from what we read. And what does he say that he has for King Eglon? He says, I have a message from the Lord. I have a message from God for you. Well, here we see that message ends up actually being the two-edged sword. I don't think it's a surprise that we get to the New Testament. And what is the symbol for God's message, God's word? It's a two-edged sword. In Revelation 1, the Lord Jesus appears. And what is it that he has coming out of his mouth? The text proclaims that he has a sharp two-edged sword sword as a tongue. It's a picture of God and his word and his justice. And who is it that he brings this to? He brings this to King Eglon, who verse 17 tells us that he was a very fat man. Now, we have to understand as we read this that this isn't some merely external commentary that the Lord has given and some playing jabs, that sort of thing. At its beginning, This is an incredibly uncommon detail that is being noted. The ancient world, there was not a lot of people that you could describe as being a very fat man. Those people didn't really exist. Now, there's all kinds of reasons for that, from the food they ate to the lifestyles they lived to their financial situation, right? But to be someone that was a very large fat man, as is described here in the ancient world, was hard to come by. In many ways, it was a picture of a physical description that's not intended to be merely external, but rather a picture of the external showing that this was a man of gluttony, of sloth, and of self-indulgence, right? This was not the type of king that would lead the front of the troops into battle. This was the type of king that stayed home and ate while many of his people would go hungry, right? It was a man that was full of self-indulgence, full of gluttony, full of sloth. And as the people's leader, he was a reflection of them in many ways, that the people were self-indulgent. They were self-absorbed. Part of God's judgment was showing the people of Israel, this is the king that you deserve. Eglon, he represents you well, Israel, right? Remember, who was it that raised up this king? But it was the Lord. 
We must realize for us that our sovereign Lord often gives us wicked leaders whom we deserve. Whether we like them or not, often they represent us well, even if that makes us uncomfortable. It's an act of our sovereign Lord. And as this scenario is playing out, as we see these details about some of the characters and the weapons building in, what then happens as they come before one another? We see in 18 through 23 this beautiful picture of Ehud's private message from the Lord. What does it begin with? In verse 18, we see Ehud had this delegation with him in order to bring tribute to the king. And then he sends away his delegates. He's saying, no, I can do this on my own. Notice the deliverer doesn't need the help of his other people who are with him. The deliverer does it all by himself. And we are saved through a deliverer who is one man, Christ Jesus, who bore our burdens in our place. Ehud stands alone. And he goes before this king and he declares to him that he has a private message for the king. And thus the king commands silence. Now when you're a king, especially a fat king, you can imagine that there's many servants and waiters and all kinds of people around him that would constantly be tending to whatever his little needs are. So when he here declares silence, he's not merely telling people to stop talking. That declaration of silence is, okay, everyone needs to leave my presence so that we can actually have peace and quiet so I can hear what this message is, right? He sends everyone out from him. And thus we see the scenario playing out that they're up on the cool roof chamber. And Ehud declares that he has a message from God for the king. Now, what's key for us to note here, it's easy for us to miss, is when Ehud says, I have a message from God for the king, he does not use the word that's typically used in the Old Testament that we see in our Bibles that says Lord in all uppercase, right? Yahweh, the God of Israel. But rather, he just uses the generic word, Hebrew word for God. So I believe it's very likely, especially given the type of king this was, that he believed he was receiving a message from a God, right? This is an idol-filled man. In fact, you see in the scenarios multiple times in this um, narrative playing out that this man has set up idols all over the place. And so I think here he's standing to attention because he wants to hear from one of these idols. He's an idol worshiper. This man has a message from an idol. I want to hear it, right? I certainly don't think he's standing to attention because he has great reverence for Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God of Israel. That wouldn't make any sense to the narrative at all. But here we see that he does stand to attention. He does give reverence to whatever this word from this, whatever God it is, he wants to hear it. And thus he stands, which we still have some symbols in our culture today of the significance of standing to attention in order to give reverence, right? When the national anthem is played, you stand to attention. If someone important enters the room, right, everyone stands to attention. Well, here, this king, this man who loved idols, was intent to hear from one, and he pulled himself up to full attention to hear what it is that Ehud had to say to him. Now, we must understand, as this is fleshing out here, the nature of a lot of Middle Eastern superstition that plays into this story. In the Middle East, or in cultures, even to this day, the left hand is considered unclean, whereas the right hand is considered clean. In these areas, often, if you use the bathroom, you were only going to use your left hand. You would never want to dirty your right hand with that sort of endeavor. As well, it would be considered extremely offensive if you were to go up to someone and try to shake their hands with your left hand, right? That would be considered absolutely unheard of. Well, we still see that fleshing out in many cultures today, and that would have been common in these cultures at this time. And one of the things, because of this superstition, because of the shame of the left hand, they simply would not allow their young boys to be left-handed. Oh, you prefer that hand? Well, too bad. Learn to use the right hand anyways, right? We're going to train that out of you because there's no way we're going to have left-handed people. That's a disgrace to us. So King Eglon was not used to seeing left-handed people. That would have been completely foreign to him. He would not have been prepared for that at all. And we see Israel was not prone to that same sort of superstition as it pertains to the hand. We see Ehud here grows up as a left-handed man. He obviously learns how to wield a weapon with it, right? He's comfortable with it. He fits his sword to be prepared for it. 
right? He's comfortable using this. Now, all of this is playing out in the narrative as we see that as they're now standing to attention, he's giving reverence to this God he's going to hear about, and he reaches over with his left hand to his right thigh. Eglon's not startled in the bit. Why is that? Because every soldier he would have ever known keeps his sword on his left thigh and would have reached for it with his right hand. And thus to see this man standing to full attention, reaching with his left hand to his right thigh, he wouldn't have even flinched. He wouldn't have seen the threat coming. It would have been a complete surprise to him, which then gives way to what we see in verses 21 through 23. And it says, And Ehud reached for his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade. This is a decently large blade, 18 inches or so. All right, that's the length of what this blade would be. That's not a small little dagger or pocket knife he's holding here, all right? An 18-inch long blade thrusted into his belly, and the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. Now, why is this important given the context of the hands? Because he never saw this happening, right? He was completely exposed, completely off guard. And we see this picture of this sodomite king completely disposed and utterly humiliated. Eglon's fat swallowed the blade, handle and all, all that was left of this wicked, evil ruler who had oppressed the people of God was the dung that lay on the floor, right? That is what's left of him. That's the picture. In a sense in which we laugh because there's a middle school boy that still exists and even grown adults, right? There's, there's part of us that just, it's funny, but what's the imagery of it? It's the imagery of being totally laid waste, Right? in his pomp, in his being, you know, this credible king who was showing by just his physical stature that he was wealthier than everyone, more powerful than them. They can go work. I don't have to work. They can be hungry. I'm not going to be hungry, right? But what was he laid to? He was laid to utter humiliation. And so what should we take from this stinky strike? Well, it should tell us two things. The first is that our God laughs at wicked rulers, Our God laughs at wicked rulers. What does it say in Psalm chapter 2? This is the text that's on the front of the bulletin this morning. It says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. But what is God's response to these wicked rulers? He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Right? The Lord sits in the heavens and laughs. Now, we see that explicitly told to us in Psalm 2, but then we see it throughout the narrative of the Old Testament as well. What happens as the ark is brought before the Philistines? And they come before this pagan god of Dagon. God chops them at the knees and makes Dagon, this massive idol that they had built, fall face down before the ark of the Lord, right? What's he doing? He's rendering their pagan idols bare, right? We see this as well in the Exodus. As the particular plagues are being given, God's showing how all these Egyptian gods are incompetent. You worship frogs? Well, guess what? Have all the frogs you like, right? He's showing a humor in these things. We see this as well with Elijah before the prophets of Baal. What does it say in 1 Kings 18, 27? Elijah mocked them, these worshipers of these Baals, saying, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he is musing or he is relieving himself or he is on a journey or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened, right? Was he saying these pagan gods you worship They're worthless, right? They're worthy to be mocked. Maybe your God that's so powerful, maybe he's just on the pot, right? Maybe he's taking a nap. He can't come to help you, right? That's what Elijah the prophet's doing before the prophets of Baal. So what is our application from this sort of thing? 
in its right place, we should embrace a lighthearted mockery at the devil's schemes. We should not ever, as a Christian, think that God and the devil are somehow on equal footing. You know that classic picture in the cartoons, right? Of you have like an angel on one shoulder and a demon on the other shoulder. And we're almost made to believe that like Jesus and the devil are equal foes. That they're equally powerful. That they're equally capable of winning a war. Nothing could be further from the truth. What do pagan gods stand against the one true and living God? Nothing, right? Their schemes will render themselves futile. Ultimately, we know who wins. We know how the end of this story goes. And thus, as the devil gives his ridiculous schemes, we should have, at times, a lighthearted sense of laughter, right? Who are you to answer to the living God, you uncircumcised Philistine, right? As David before Goliath. He's not afraid of this guy. He might look big, but do you know how big his God is? Do we have that mindset? The Lord sits in the heaven and laughs. He holds them all in derision. We must also see from this example that it's not only showing us God's humor in these things, but it's also symbolic. In the law of God, feces was seen as ceremonially unclean, right? Wasn't even allowed in the camp. It certainly wasn't part of their purification rites. It was very particular on how they were to handle their defecation, right? You read about that in the law of God. So thus, there's a picture here as God is deposing this leader in such a way that God is symbolically ridding them of their uncleanness by deposing this ruler in this fashion. And what is it that causes this unclean ruler's bowels to be opened up? Well, the Yasha, the deliverer, piercing the king with the sharp double-edged sword. And they pierce him with just a piece of that sword. Remember, again, the sword is a picture of the word of God in the rest of the scriptures. Did he give them just the New Testament, just the uplifting Psalms? No, he took the entirety of that two-edged sword and sunk it into the large belly of the foe. The whole sword, hilt and all, this message from God for the king was symbolic of a type of gospel. For our Messiah, our deliverer, destroys the power of Satan, a fat, useless king, and spills his bowels with his two-edged sword. Our Savior sits in the heavens and laughs. He destroys the kings and the powers of this world who come against him. This is a picture of the book of Revelation, is it not? Our Savior bearing the two-edged sword, destroying the great dragon and delivering his people. This is what our God does. The story is comical and it's glorious. That is, if you're on the deliverer's side, if you're found with Yahweh, if you're found with the Deliverer, this is a story to tell your children of, right? This is a great work of God on your behalf, saving you from a wicked oppressor. But if your allegiances are with Eglon, the result of this encounter is quite humiliating, is it not? Now make no mistake, if you have yet to bow to King Jesus, your loyalties lie with Eglon. He is your king. He represents you. And these next few verses are a picture of your own humiliation if you fail to turn from him. Listen to what it says in verse 24 and 25. It says, When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he's relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. Why were they thinking that? Because it stunk out there, all right? They smelled it. This wasn't an accident. Verse 25, and they waited till, what does it say? They were embarrassed. They're out there humiliated. What's happening in there? But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them. This was probably a fearful act for interrupting the king who had commanded silence. Certainly could have been their death blow. So they're doing this with fear and trepidation. And there lay their Lord dead on the floor. They were humiliated. I must tell you, if you are not worshiping the Lord, you're putting your hope in something that will fail you. You're putting your hope in something that will utterly humiliate you. 
the gods that you're chasing, the idols of this age, they will leave you humiliated. And one day you will see these lords that you've worshipped dead on the floor, covered in their own feces, right? It's gross, but that's the picture of what happens when we worship something other than the one true living God. If you're not following Jesus, I praise your eyes will be open to that this morning, which leads to our final point, the faithful follow-up in verses 26 through 30. So what happens after this large king is laid to waste? Well, we see the faithful follow-up in these final verses. Read with me beginning in verse 26. It says, Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Syrah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Now there's some glorious aspects and details of these final few verses. We won't be able to flesh out all of them this morning. But first we should note in verse 26 that as he was leaving this deposed king, he passed by their idols. And did their idols leap out and stop him and prevent him from going any further? No, the picture is that he just waltzed right by, right? Their idols are incapable of stopping him, right? He waltzes past them. And then in verse 27, he sounds the trumpet to call the people to battle. I must, again, remind you that the details of this are always supposed to point us to Christ. We noted in Revelation 1, as Jesus appears, that he comes with a sharp two-edged sword in his mouth. But what does it also tell us of Jesus in Revelation 1? It says in Revelation 1, 10 through 11, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Jesus is calling to us with a trumpet sound as well. The Alpha and Omega has spoken and he has called us as his saints into battle. Are we ready to listen? What is it that he goes on to say in verse 28 as Ehud is leading the people into battle? He says, follow me, follow me. And what does Jesus say to us as he calls his own disciples? He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Saints, your Savior is calling you to follow him into battle. Will you deny him? And then what does it say at the end of verse 28? It says, the Lord has given the enemies into their hands. Well, certainly our Savior and Deliverer has done that as well, has he not? Listen to what it says in Zechariah's prophecy at the beginning of Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter 1, verse 71, it says that we will be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Who is it that will deliver us from the hand of our enemies? Call us at trumpet call. Say, follow him. It is our deliverer, our Yasha, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then this ends with a beautiful picture of them coming from the hill country down into the Jordan and then defeating their enemies at the banks of the Jordan. Now, let me ask you, when God's people are led to the Jordan River, what does he do? right? He lets them through on dry ground. He saves them through the mighty waters. But when God's enemies are pushed back to the boundary of that Jordan, does he open up the path in order to let them through? No, they are succumbed by his wrath and judgment of his people who answered his trumpet call. It is a picture that God will defend his people, and the location of that battle certainly is symbolic. One final detail for us to grasp is noting just as the Lord's discipline increases in this text, so does his grace and mercy. How long were they given rest for at the end of this text? 80 years. 
Last time we saw 40. Now we see 80. When that, again, that 40 number is a picture of a generation in the Bible. So here we see that God gives them rest for two generations because he is certainly a merciful God to the people. In conclusion, saints, trust in your Savior. He is a powerful deliverer. The enemy cannot stand against him. Fight for your Savior. His trumpet calls us into battle to arm ourselves with the full armor of God, to wield the sword of his word in order to take down all his enemies. And far more than the enemies that were slain on the banks of the Jordan, the Lord who's sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning, will make every enemy of his his footstool. There's not an enemy that won't be conquered by our reigning deliverer, so fight for him. And third, in a righteous and appropriate way, learn how to mock the enemy. Know who's on your side. Don't treat the devil as if he's an equal foe. It's true that the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking to devour. But know it's also true? The lion of the tribe of Judah is in your corner. He's far more powerful than that lame lion, the devil. Believe it. Live like it. Follow him because of it. Would you pray with me? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, would we worship you as the great God of heaven and earth? Would we see what a great deliverer you have provided for us through your son, Jesus Christ? Would we see how incompetent the enemies of God are before you? And would we see with great glory that you have delivered us by your mercy from our allegiance to the king of sin and purchased us into your kingdom? God, would we live like the things we studied this morning are true? Would we not just enjoy the narrative? Would you help us apply the narrative through the gospel? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.